Chapter Four of the Mysteries of Paris, Volume Two. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Mysteries of Paris by Eugène Sue. Chapter Four, The Ambuscade. The church and parsonage of Bouqueval were placed on the side of a hill covered with chestnut trees and commanded an entire view of the village. Fleur de Marie and the Abbé reached a winding path which led to the clergyman's home, crossing the sunken road by which the hill was intersected diagonally the chouette the schoolmaster and tortillard concealed in one of the hollows of the road saw the priest and fleur-de-marie descend into the ravine and leave it again by a steep declivity the features of the young girl being hidden under the hood of her cloak the chouette did not recognize her old victim silence my old boy said the old harridan to the schoolmaster the young mo and the black slug are just crossing the path i know her by the description which the tall man in black gave us a country appearance neither tall nor short a petticoat shot with brown and a woollen mantle with a black border she walks every day with a devil dodger to his crib and returns alone when she come back which she will do presently by the end of the road we must spring upon her and carry her off to the coach if she cries for help replied the schoolmaster they will hear her at the farm if as you say the outbuildings are visible from here for you you can see he added in a sullen tone oh yes we can see the buildings from here quite plainly said tortillard it is only a minute ago that i climbed to the top of the bank and lying down on my belly i could hear a carter who was talking to his horses in the yard there i'll tell you then what we must do said the schoolmaster after a moment's silence let tortillard have the watch at the entrance to the path when he sees the young girl returning let him go and meet her saying that he is the son of a poor old woman who has hurt herself by falling down the hollow road and beg the girl to come to her assistance i'm up to you fourline the poor old woman is your darling chouette you're wide awake my man you are always the king of the downy ones Teta. what must i do afterwards conceal yourself in the hollow way on the side where barbillon is waiting with the coach i will be at hand when tortillard has brought the wench to you in the middle of the ravine leave off whimpering and spring upon her put one molly round her squeeze and the other into her patter-box and grab her red rag to prevent her from squeaking i know i know fourline as we did with the woman at the canal of st martin when we gave her cold water for supper and drowned her after having prigged her negress the parcel wrapped in black oilskin which she had under her arm the same dodge isn't it yes precisely but mind grab the girl tight whilst tortillard comes and fetches me we three will then bundle her up in my cloak carry her to barbillon's coach from thence to the plain of st denis where the man in black will await us that's the way to do business my fourline you are without an equal if i could i would let off a firework on your head and illuminate you with the colours of st charlot the patron of scragsmen do you see you urchin if you would be an out and outer make my husband your model said the chouette boastingly to tortillard then addressing the schoolmaster by the way do you know that barbillon is in an awful funk fright he thinks that he shall be had up before the beaks on a swinging matter why the other day returning from mother marshall's the widow of the man who was scragged and who keeps the boozing can in the Ile du ravageur barbillon the gros boiteux and the skeleton had a row with the husband of the milkwoman who comes every morning from the country in a little cart drawn by a donkey to sell her milk in the cité at the corner of the rue de la vieille draperie close to the ogresses of the white rabbit and they walked into him with their slashers killed him with their knives the son of bras rouge who did not understand slang listened to the chouette with a sort of disappointed curiosity you would like to know little man what we are saying wouldn't you yes you were talking of mother marshall who is at the ile du ravageur near asnières i know her very well and her daughter calebasse and francois and amandine who are about as old as i am and who are made to bear everybody's snubs and thumps in the house but when you talked of walking into butter any one that's slang i know it is and if you're a very good chap i'll teach you to patter flash 
you're just the age when it may be very useful to you would you like to learn my precious lambkin i rather think i should too and no mistake and i would rather live with you than with my old cheat of a mountbank pounding his drugs if i knew where he hides his rat poison for men i'd put some in his soup and then that would settle the quarrel between us the chouette laughed heartily and said to tortillard drawing him towards her come chick and kiss his mammy what a droll boy it is a darling but my mannikin how didst thou know that he had rat poison for men why cause i heard him say so one day when i was hid in the cupboard in the room where he keeps his bottles his brass machines and where he mixes his stuffs together what did you hear him say asked the chouette i heard him say to a gentleman that he gave a powder to in a paper when you are tired of life take this in three doses and you will sleep without sickness or sorrow who was the gentleman asked the schoolmaster oh a very handsome gentleman with black mustachios and a face as pretty as a girl's he came another time and then when he left i followed him by m bradamanti's order to find out where he perched the fine gentleman went into the rue du chaillot and entered a very grand house my master said to me no matter where this gentleman goes follow and wait for him at the door if he comes out again still keep your eye on him until he does not come out of the place where he enters and that will prove that he lives there then tortillard my boy twist tortille yourself about to find out his name or i will twist your ears in a way that will astonish you well well i did twist myself about and found out his name how did you manage it inquired the schoolmaster why so i'm not a fool so i went to the porter at the house in the rue de chaillot where this gentleman had gone in and not come out again the porter had his hair finely powdered with a fine brown coat with a yellow collar trimmed with silver so i says to him good gentleman i have come to ask for a hundred sous which the gentleman of the house has promised me for having found his dog and brought it back to him a little black dog called trumpet and the gentleman with dark features with black mustachios a white riding-coat and light blue pantaloons told me he lived at number eleven rue de chaillot and that his name was dupont the gentleman you're talking of is my master and his name is the viscount de saint remy and we have no dog here but yourself you young scamp so cut your stick or i'll make you remember coming here and trying to do me out of a hundred sous says the porter to me and he gave me a kick as he said it but i didn't mind that added tortillard most philosophically for i found out the name of the handsome young gentleman with black mustachios who came to my master's to buy the rat poison for men who are tired of living he is called the viscount de saint remy my my saint remy added the son of bras rouge humming the last words as was his usual habit clever little darling i could eat him up alive said the chouette embracing tortillard never was such a knowing fellow he deserves that i should be his mother the dear rascal does and the hag embraced tortillard with an absurd affectation the son of bras rouge touched by this proof of affection and desirous of showing his gratitude eagerly answered only you tell me what to do and you shall see how i'll do it will you though well then you shan't repent doing so oh i should like always to stay with you if you behave well we may see about that you shan't leave us if you are a good boy yes said the schoolmaster you shall lead me about like a poor blind man and say you are my son we will get into houses in this way and then ten thousand slaughters added the assassin with enthusiasm the chouette will assist us in making lucky hits i will then teach that devil of a rodolphe who blinded me that i am not quite done for he took away my eyesight but he could not did not remove my bent for mischief i would be the head tortillard the eyes and you the hand eh chouette you will help me in this won't you am i not with you to gallows and rope fourline didn't i when i left the hospital and learnt that you had sent the yokel from st mandé to ask for me at the ogress's didn't i run to you at the village directly telling those chaw-bacons of labourers that i was your rib 
these words of the one-eyed reminded the schoolmaster of an unpleasant affair and altering his tone and language with the chouette he said in a surly tone yes i was getting tired of being all by myself with these honest people after a month i could not stand it any longer i was frightened so then i thought of trying to find you out and a nice thing i did for myself he added in a tone of increasing anger for the day after you arrived i was robbed of the rest of the money which that devil in the alley des veuves had given me yes some one stole my belt full of gold whilst i was asleep it was only you who could have done it and so now i am at your mercy whenever i think of it i can hardly restrain myself from killing you on the spot you cursed old robber you and he stepped towards the old woman look out for yourself if you try to do any harm to the chouette cried tortillard i will smash you both you and she base vipers as you are cried the ruffian enraged and hearing the boy mumbling near him he aimed at him so violent a blow with his fist as must have killed him if it had struck him tortillard as much to revenge himself as the chouette picked up a stone took aim and struck the schoolmaster on the forehead the blow was not dangerous but very painful the brigand grew furious with passion raging like a wounded bull and rushing forward swiftly and at random stumbled <laughs> what break your own back shouted the chouette laughing till she cried despite the bloody ties which bound her to this monster she saw how entirely and with a sort of savage delight this man formerly so dreaded and so proud of his giant strength was reduced to impotence the old wretch by these feelings justified that cold-blooded idea of la rochefoucauld's that there is something in the misfortunes of our best friends which does not displease us the disgusting brat with his tawny cheeks and weasel face enjoyed and participated in the mirth of the one-eyed hag the schoolmaster tripped again and the urchin exclaimed open your peepers old fellow look about you you are going the wrong way what capers you are cutting can't you see your way why don't you wipe your eyeglasses unable to seize on the boy the athletic murderer stopped struck his foot violently on the ground put his enormous and hairy fists to his eyes and then uttered a sound which resembled the hoarse scream of a muzzled tiger got a bad cough i'm afraid old chap said bras rouge's brat your horse i'm afraid i have some capital licorice which a gendarme gave me perhaps you'd like to try it and taking up a handful of sand he threw it in the face of the ruffian struck full in his countenance by this shower of gravel the schoolmaster suffered still more severely by this last attack than by the blow from the stone become pale in spite of his livid and cicatrized features he extended his two arms suddenly in the form of a cross in a moment of inexpressible agony and despair and raising his frightful face to heaven he cried in a voice of deep suffering mon dieu mon dieu mon dieu this involuntary appeal to divine mercy by a man stained by every crime a bandit in whose presence but very recently the most resolute of his fellows trembled appeared like an interposition of providence ha 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 said the chouette in a mocking tone look at the thief making the crucifix you mistake your road my man it is the old one you should call to your help a knife oh for a knife to kill myself a knife since all the world abandons me shrieked the wretch gnawing his fist for very agony and rage a knife there's one in your pocket cut-throat and with an edge too the little old man in the rue du roule you know one moonlight night and the cattle dealer in the poissy road could tell the moles all about it but if you want it it's here the schoolmaster when thus instructed changed the conversation and replied in a surly and threatening tone the chourineur was true he did not rob but had pity on me why did you say that i had prigged your blunt inquired the chouette hardly able to restrain her laughter it was only you who came into my room said the miscreant i was robbed on the night of your arrival and who else could i suspect those country people could not have done such a thing why should not country people steal as well as other folks 
is it because they drink milk and gather grass for their rabbits i don't know i only know i'm robbed and is that the fault of your own chouette what suspect me do you think if i had got your belt that i should stay any longer with you what a fool you are why if i had chosen to pout your blunt i could of course but as true as i'm chouette you would have seen me again when the pewter was spent for i like you as well now with your eyes white as i did you rogue you come be decent and leave off grinding your snags in that way or you'll break em it's just as if he was a cracking nuts said tortillard <laughs> what a droll baby it is but quiet now quiet my man of men let him laugh it is but an infant you must own you have been unfair for when the tall man in mourning who looks like a mute at a funeral said to me a thousand francs are yours if you carry off this young girl from the farm at bouqueval and bring her to the spot in the plain of st denis that i shall tell you say cut-throat didn't i directly tell you of the affair and agree to share with you instead of choosing some pal with his eyesight clear why it's like making you a handsome present for doing nothing for unless to bundle up the girl and carry her with tortillard's assistance you would be of no more use to me than the fifth wheel to an omnibus but never mind for although i could have robbed you if i would i like on the contrary to do you service i should wish you to owe everything to your darling chouette that's my way that is we must give two hundred bob to barbillon for driving the coach and coming once before with the servant of the tall man in mourning to look about the place and determine where we should hide ourselves whilst we waited for the young miss and then we shall have eight hundred bob between us what do you say to that old boy what still angry with your old woman how do i know that you will give me a mag when once the thing's done why i said the ruffian in a tone of gloomy distrust why if i like i need not give you a dump that's true enough for you are on my gridiron my lad as i once had the goualeuse and so i will broil you to my own taste till the old one gets the cooking of my darling ha <laughs> ha what still sulky with your chouette added the horrible woman patting the shoulder of the ruffian who stood mute and motionless you are right said he with a sigh of concentrated rage it is my fate mine mine at the mercy of a woman and child whom but lately i could have killed with a blow oh if i were not afraid of dying said he falling back against the bank what a coward you you a coward said the chouette contemptuously why you'll be talking next of your conscience what a precious farce well if you haven't more pluck than that i'll cut and leave you and that i cannot have my revenge of the man who in thus making a martyr of me has reduced me to the wretched situation in which i am screamed the schoolmaster in a renewal of fury i am afraid of death yes i own it i am afraid but if i were told this man rodolph is between your arms your two arms and now you shall both be flung into a pit i would say throw us then at once yes for then i should be safe not to relax my clutch till we both reach the bottom together i would fix my teeth in his face his throat his heart i would tear him to pieces with my teeth yes my teeth for i should be jealous of a knife bravo fourline now you are my own dear love again calm yourself we will find him again that wretch of a rodolph and the chourineur too come pluck up old man we will yet work our will on them both i say it on both well then you will not forsake me cried the brigand to the chouette in a subdued tone mingled however with distrust if you do leave me what will become of me that's true i say fourline what a joke if tortillard and i were to mizzle with the drag and leave you where you are in the middle of the fields and the night air begins to nip very sharp i say it would be a joke old cut-purse wouldn't it 
at this threat the schoolmaster shuddered and coming towards the chouette said tremulously no no you wouldn't do that chouette nor you tortillard it would be too bad wouldn't it ha 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 too bad says he the gentle dear and the little old man in the rue du roule and the cattle dealer and the woman in st martin's canal and the gentleman in the allée des veuves they found you nice and amiable i don't think didn't they with your larding pin why then in your turn shouldn't you be left to such tender mercy as you have showed i'm in your power don't abuse it said the schoolmaster come come i confess i was wrong to suspect you i was wrong to try and thump tortillard and you see i beg pardon and of you too tortillard yes i ask pardon of both i will have to ask pardon on your knees for having tried to beat the chouette said tortillard you rum little beggar how funny you are said the chouette laughing loudly but i should like to see what a guy you will make of yourself so on your knees as if you were pattering love to your old darling come do it directly or we will leave you and i tell you that in half an hour it will be quite dark though you don't look as if you thought so old no eyes night or day what's that to him said tortillard saucily the gentleman always has his shutters closed then here on my knees i humbly ask your pardon chouette and yours also tortillard will not that content you said the robber kneeling in the middle of the highway and now will you leave me this strange group enclosed by the embankment of the ravine and lighted by the red glimmer of the twilight was hideous to behold in the middle of the road the schoolmaster on his knees extended his large and coarse hands towards the one-eyed hag his thick and matted hair which his fright had dishevelled left exposed his motionless rigid glassy dead eyeballs the very glance of a corpse stooping deprecatingly his broad spread shoulders this hercules kneels abjectly and trembles at the feet of an old woman and a child the old hag herself wrapped in a red-checked shawl her head covered with an old cap of black lace which allowed some locks of her grizzled hair to escape looked down with an air of haughty contempt and domineering pride on the schoolmaster the bony scorched shrivelled and livid countenance of the parrot-nosed old harridan expressed a savage and insulting joy her small but fierce eye glistened like a burning coal a sinister expression curled her lips shaded with long straight hairs and revealed three or four large yellow and decayed fangs tortillard clothed in a blouse with a leathern belt standing on one leg leaned on the chouette's arm to keep himself upright the bad expression and cunning look of this deformed imp with a complexion as sallow as his hair betokened at this moment his disposition half fiend half monkey the shadow cast from the declivity of the ravine increased the horrid tout ensemble of the scene which the increasing darkness half hid promise me oh promise me at least not to forsake me repeated the schoolmaster frightened by the silence of the chouette and tortillard who were enjoying his dismay are you not here added the murderer leaning forward to listen and advancing his arms mechanically yes my man we are here don't be frightened forsake you leave my love the man of my heart no i'd sooner be scragged once for all i will tell you why i will not forsake you listen and profit i have always liked to have some one in my grip beast or christian before i had pigriotte oh that the old one would return her to my clutch for i have still my idea of scaling off her beauty with my bottle of vitriol before pegriotte's turn i had a brat who froze to death under my care for that little job i got six years in the stone jug then i used to have little birds which i used to tame and then pluck em alive ha ha but that was troublesome work for they did not last long when i left the jug the goualeuse came to hand but the little brat ran away before i had half my fun out of her carcass well then i had a dog who had his little troubles as well as she had and i cut off one of his hind feet and one of his fore feet 
and you never saw such a rum beggar as i made of him i almost burst my sides with laughing at him i must serve a dog i know of who bit me one day in the same way said the promising master tortillard when i fell in again with you my darling continued the chouette i was trying what i could do that was miserable with a cat well now at this moment you old boy shall be my cat my dog my bird my pigriotte you shall be anything to worry bête de souffrance do you understand my love instead of having a bird or a child to make miserable i shall have as it were a wolf or a tiger i think that's rather a bright idea isn't it hag devil cried the schoolmaster rising in a desperate rage what my pet angry with his darling old dearie well if it must be so it must have your own way you have a right to it good night blind sheep the field gate is wide open so walk alone mr no eyes and if you toddle straight you'll reach the right road somehow said tortillard laughing heartily oh that i could die 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 said the schoolmaster writhing and twisting his arms about in agony at this moment tortillard stooping to the ground exclaimed in a low voice i hear footsteps in the path let us hide it is not the young miss for they come the same way as she did on the instant a stout peasant girl in the prime of youth followed by a large shepherd's dog carrying on her head an open basket appeared and followed the same path which the priest and the goualeuse had taken we will rejoin the two latter leaving the three accomplices concealed in the hollow of the path end of chapter four read by celine major chapter five of the mysteries of paris volume two this librivox recording is in the public domain the mysteries of paris by eugene sue chapter five the rectory house the last rays of the sun were gradually disappearing behind the vast pile of the chateau des coins and the woods which surrounded it on all sides until the sight lost them in the distance were vast tracts of land lying in brown furrows hardened by the frost an extensive desert of which the hamlet of bouqueval appeared to be the oasis the sky which was serenely glorious was tinted by the sunset and glowed with long lines of empurpled light the certain token of wind and cold these tints which were at first of a deep red became violet then a bluish black as the twilight grew more and more dark on the atmosphere the crescent of the moon was as delicately and clearly defined as a silver ring and began to shine beautifully in the midst of the blue and dim sky where many stars already had appeared the silence was profound the hour most solemn the curate stopped for a moment on the summit of the acclivity to enjoy the calm of this delicious evening after some minutes reflection he extended his trembling hand towards the depths of the horizon half veiled by the shadows of the evening and said to fleur de marie who was walking pensively beside him look my child at the vastness and extent to which we have no visible limit we hear not the slightest sound say does not this silence give us an idea of infinity and of eternity i say this to you marie because you are peculiarly sensitive of the beauties of creation i have often been struck at the admiration alike poetical and religious with which they inspire you you a poor prisoner so long deprived of them are you not as i am struck with the solemn tranquillity of the hour the goualeuse made no reply the cure regarding her with astonishment found she was weeping what ails you my child my father i am unhappy unhappy you still unhappy i know it is ingratitude to complain of my lot after all that has been and is done for me and yet and yet father i pray of you to forgive my sorrows their expression may offend my benefactors listen marie we have often asked you the cause of these sorrows with which you are depressed 
and which excite in your second mother the most serious uneasiness you have avoided all reply and we have respected your secret whilst we have been afflicted at not being able to solace your sorrows alas good father i dare not tell you what is passing in my mind i have been moved as you have been at the sight of this calm and saddening evening my heart is sorely afflicted and i have wept but what ails you marie you know how we love you come tell me all you should for i must tell you that the time is very close at hand when madame georges and m rodolphe will present you at the baptismal font and take upon themselves the engagement before god to protect you all the days of your life m rodolphe he who has saved me cried fleur de marie clasping her hands he will deign to give me this new proof of affection oh indeed my father i can no longer conceal from you anything lest i should indeed deserve to be called and thought an ingrate an ingrate how that you may understand me i must begin and tell you of my first day at the farm then let us talk as we walk on you will be indulgent to me my father what i shall say may perhaps be wrong the lord has shown his mercy on to you be of good heart when said fleur de marie after a moment's reflection i knew that on arriving here i should not again leave the farm and madame georges i believed it was all a dream at first i felt giddy with my happiness and thought every moment of m rodolphe very often when i was alone and in spite of myself i raised my eyes to heaven as if to seek him there and thank him afterwards and i was wrong father i thought more of him than god attributing to him what god alone could do i was happy as happy as a creature who had suddenly and entirely escaped from a great danger you and madame georges were so kind to me that i thought i deserved pity rather than blame the cure looked at the goualeuse with an air of surprise she continued gradually i became used to my sweet course of life i no longer felt fear when i awoke or finding myself at the ogress's i seemed to sleep in full security and all my delight was to assist madame georges in her work and to apply myself to the lesson you gave me my father as well as to profit by your advice and exhortation except some moments of shame when i reflected on the past i thought myself equal to all the world because all the world was so kind to me when one day her sobs cut short poor fleur de marie's narration come come my poor child calm yourself courage courage the goualeuse wiped her eyes and resumed you recollect father during the fate of the toussaint that madame dubreuil who superintends the duc de lucenay's farm at arnouville came with her daughter to pass some time with us i do and i was delighted to see you form an acquaintance with clara dubreuil who is a very excellent girl she is an angel an angel father when i knew that she was coming to stay for some days at the farm my delight was so great that i could think of nothing else but the moment when she should arrive at length she came i was in my room which she was to share with me and whilst i was putting it into nice order i was sent for i went into the saloon my heart beating excessively when madame georges presenting me to the pretty young lady whose looks were so kind and good said marie here is a friend for you i hope added madame dubreuil that you and my daughter will soon be like two sisters and hardly had her mother uttered these words then mademoiselle clara came and embraced me then father continued fleur de marie weeping i do not know what came over me but when i felt the fresh and fair face of clara pressed against my cheek of shame that cheek became scorching with guilt remorse i remembered who and what i was i-i to receive the caresses of a good and virtuous girl why my child ah oh, my father cried fleur de marie interrupting the cure with painful emotion when m rodolphe took me away from the cité i began vaguely to be conscious of the depth of my degradation but do you think that education advice the examples i receive from madame georges and yourself have not whilst they have enlightened my mind made me alas to comprehend but too clearly that i have been more culpable than unfortunate before clara's arrival when these thoughts grew upon me 
i drove them away by seeking to please madame georges and you father if i blushed for the past it was only in my own presence but the sight of this young lady of my own age so charming so virtuous has conjured up the recollection of the distance that exists between us and for the first time i have felt that there are wrongs which nothing can efface from that time the thought has haunted me perpetually and in spite of myself i recur to it from that day i have not had one moment's repose the goualeuse again wiped her eyes that swam in tears after having looked at her for some moments with a gaze of the tenderest pity the cure replied reflect my child that if madame georges desired to see you the friend of mademoiselle dubreuil it was that she felt you were worthy of such a confidence from your good conduct your reproaches addressed to yourself seem almost to impugn your second mother i feel that father and was wrong no doubt but i could not subdue my shame and fear when clara was once settled at the farm i was as sad as i had before i thought i should be happy when i reflected on the pleasure of having a companion of my own age she on the contrary was all joy and lightness she had a bed in my apartment and the first evening before she went to bed she kissed me saying that she loved me already and felt every kind sentiment towards me she made me call her clara and she would call me marie then she said her prayers telling me that she would join my name with hers in her prayers if i could also unite her name with mine i did not dare to refuse and after talking for some time she went to sleep i had not got into my bed and approaching her bedside i contemplated her angel face with tears in my eyes and then reflecting that she was sleeping in the same chamber with me with one who had been at the ogresses mixed up with robbers and murderers i trembled as if i had committed some crime and a thousand nameless fears beset me i thought that god one day would punish me i went to sleep and had horrid dreams i saw again those frightful objects i had nearly forgotten the chourineur the schoolmaster the chouette that horrible one-eyed woman who had tortured my earliest infancy oh what a night mon dieu what a night what dreams said the goualeuse shuddering at their very recollection poor marie said the cure with emotion why did you not earlier tell me all this i should have found comfort for you but go on i slept so late that mademoiselle clara awoke me by kissing me to overcome what she called my coldness and show her regard she told me a secret that she was going to be married when she was eighteen to the son of a farmer at goussainville whom she loved very dearly and the union had long been agreed upon by the two families then she added a few words of her past life so simple calm and happy she had never quitted her mother and never intended to do so for her husband was to take part in the management of the farm with m dubreuil now marie she said you know me as well as if you were my sister so tell me all about your early days i thought when i heard the words that i should have died of them i blushed and stammered i did not know what madame georges had said of me and i was fearful of telling a falsehood i answered vaguely that i had been an orphan educated by a very rigid person and that i had not been happy in my infancy and that my happiness was dated from the moment when i had come to live with madame georges then clara as much by interest as curiosity asked me where i had been educated in the city or the country my father's name and above all if i remembered anything of my mother all these questions embarrassed me as much as they pained me for i was obliged to reply with falsehood and you have taught me father how wicked it is to lie but clara did not think i was deceiving her she attributed the hesitation of my answers to the pain which my early sorrows renewed she believed me and pitied me with a sincerity that cut me to the soul oh father you never can know what i suffered in this conversation and how much it cost me only to reply in language of falsehood and hypocrisy unfortunate girl the anger of heaven will weigh heavily on those who by casting you into the vile road of perdition have compelled you to undergo all your life the sad consequences of a first fault oh yes they were indeed cruel father replied fleur-de-marie bitterly for my shame is ineffaceable 
as clara talked to me of the happiness that awaited her her marriage her peaceful joys of home i could not help comparing my lot with hers for in spite of the kindness showered upon me my fate must always be miserable you and madame georges in teaching me what virtue is have taught me the depth of that abasement into which i had fallen nothing can take me from the brand of having been the refuse of all that is vilest in the world alas if the knowledge of good and evil was to be so sad to me why not have abandoned me to my unhappy fate oh marie marie father i speak ill do i not alas i dare not confess it but i am at times so ungrateful as to repine at the benefits heaped upon me and say to myself if i had not been snatched from infamy why wretchedness misery blows would soon have ended my life and at least i should have remained in ignorance of that purity which i must for ever regret alas marie that is indeed fatal a nature ever so nobly endowed by the creator though plunged but for one day in the foul mire from which you have been extricated will preserve for ever the ineffaceable stigma yes yes my father cried fleur de marie full of grief i must despair until i die you must despair of ever tearing out this frightful page from the book of your existence said the priest in a sad and serious voice but you must have faith in the infinite mercy of the almighty here on earth my poor child there are for you tears remorse expiation but one day there up there and he raised his hand to the sky now filling with stars there is pardon and everlasting happiness pity pity mon dieu i am so young and my life may still endure so long said the goualeuse in a voice rent by agony and falling at the cure's knees almost involuntarily the priest was standing at the top of the hill not far from where his modest mansion rose his black cassock his venerable countenance shaded by long white locks lighted by the last ray of twilight stood out from the horizon which was of a deep transparency a perfect clearness pale gold in the west sapphire over his head the priest again elevated towards heaven one of his tremulous hands and gave the other to fleur de marie who bedewed it with her tears the hood of her grey cloak fell at this moment from her shoulders displaying the perfect outline of her lovely profile her charming features full of suffering and suffused with tears this simple and sublime scene offered a strange contrast a singular coincidence with the horrid one which almost at the same moment was passing in the ravine between the schoolmaster and the chouette concealed in the darkness of the sombre cleft assailed by base fears a fearful murderer carrying on his person the punishment of his crimes was also on his knees but in the presence of an accessory a sneering revengeful fury who tormented him mercilessly and urged him on to fresh crimes that accomplice the first cause of fleur de marie's misery a fleur de marie whose days and nights were embittered by never dying remorse whose anguish hardly endurable was not conceivable surrounded from her earliest days by degraded cruel infamous outcasts of society leaving the walls of a prison for the den of the ogress even a more horrid prison never leaving the precincts of her jail or the squalid streets of the cite this unhappy young creature had hitherto lived in utter ignorance of the beautiful and the good as strange to noble and religious sentiments as to the magnificent splendour of nature then all that was admirable in the creature and in the creator was revealed in a moment to her astonished soul at this striking spectacle her mind expanded her intelligence unfolded itself her noble instincts were awakened and because her mind expanded because her intelligence was unfolded because her noble instincts were awakened yet the very consciousness of her early degradation brings with it the feeling of horror for her past life alike torturing and enduring she feels as she had described that alas there are stains which nothing can remove an unhappiness for me said the goualeuse in despair my whole life has long to run it may be were it as long as pure as your own father it must henceforth be blighted by the knowledge and consciousness of the past unhappiness for me for ever on the contrary marie it is happiness for you yes happiness for you your remorse so full of bitterness but so purifying 
testifies the religious susceptibility of your mind how many there are who less nobly sensitive than you would in your place have soon forgotten the fact and only revelled in the delight of the present believe me every pang that you now endure will tell in your favour when on high god has left you for a moment in an unrighteous path to reserve for you the glory of repentance and the everlasting reward reserved for expiation has he not said himself those who fight the good fight and come to me with a smile on their lips they are my chosen but they who wounded in the struggle come to me fainting and dying they are the chosen amongst my chosen courage then my child support help counsel nothing will fail you i am very aged but madame georges and m rodolph have still many years before them particularly m rodolph who has taken so deep an interest in you who watches your progress with so much anxiety the goualeuse was about to reply when she was interrupted by the peasant girl whom we have already mentioned who having followed in the steps of the cure and marie now came up to them she was one of the peasants of the farm beg your pardon monsieur le cure she said to the priest but madame georges told me to bring this basket of fruit to the rectory and then i could accompany mademoiselle marie back again for it is getting late so i have brought turk with me added the dairymaid patting an enormous dog of the pyrenees which would have mastered a bear in a struggle although we never have any bad people about us here in the country it is as well to be careful you are quite right claudine here we are now at the rectory pray thank madame georges for me then addressing the goualeuse in a low tone the cure said to her in a grave voice i must go to-morrow to the conference of the diocese but i shall return at five o'clock if you like my child i will wait for you at the rectory i see your state of mind and that you require a lengthened conversation with me i thank you father replied fleur de marie to-morrow i will come since you are so good as to allow me to do so here we are at the garden gate said the priest leave your basket there claudine my housekeeper will take it return quickly to the farm with marie for it is almost night and the cold is increasing to-morrow marie at five o'clock to-morrow father the abbe went into his garden the goualeuse and claudine followed by turk took the road to the farm End of chapter five read by Celine major chapter six of the mysteries of paris volume two this librivox recording is in the public domain the mysteries of paris by eugene sue chapter six the rencounter the night set in clear and cold following the advice of the schoolmaster the chouette had gone to that part of the hollow way which was the most remote from the path and nearest to the cross-road where barbillon was waiting with a hackney coach tortillard who was posted as an advanced guard watched for the return of fleur de marie whom he was desirous of drawing into the trap by begging her to come to the assistance of a poor old woman the son of bras rouge had advanced a few steps out of the ravine to try and discern marie when he heard the goualeuse some way off speaking to the peasant girl who accompanied her the plan had failed and tortillard quickly went down into the ravine to run and inform the chouette there is somebody with the young girl said he in a low and breathless tone may the hangman squeeze her we send the little beggar exclaimed the chouette in a rage who's with her asked the schoolmaster oh no doubt the country wench who passed along the road just now followed by a large dog i heard a woman's voice said tortillard hark do you hear there's the noise of their sabots and in the silence of the night the wooden soles sounded clearly on the ground hardened by the frost there are two of them i can manage the young one in the grey mantle but what can we do with the other fourline can't see and tortillard is too weak to do for the companion devil choke her what can be done asked the chouette i'm not strong but if you like i'll cling to the legs of the countrywoman with the dog i'll hold on by hands and teeth and not let her go i can tell you you can take away the little one in the meantime you know chouette if they cry or resist they will hear them at the farm replied the chouette and come to their assistance before we can reach barbillon's coach 
it is no easy thing to carry off a woman who resists and they have a large dog with them said tortillard bah bah if it was only that i could break the brute's skull with a blow of my shoe-heel said the chouette here they are replied tortillard who was listening still to the echo of their footsteps they are coming down the hollow now why don't you speak fourline said the chouette to the schoolmaster what is best to be done long-headed as you are eh are you grown dumb there is nothing to be done to-day replied the miscreant and the thousand bob of the man in mourning said the chouette they are gone then i'd sooner your knife your knife fourline i will stick the companion that she may be no trouble to us and as to the young miss tortillard and i can make off with her but the man in mourning does not desire that we should kill any one well then we must put the cold meat down as an extra in his bill he must pay for he will be an accomplice with us here they come down the hill said tortillard softly your knife lad said the chouette in a similar tone a chouette cried tortillard in alarm and extending his hands to the hag that is too bad to kill no oh no your knife i tell you repeated the chouette in an undertone without paying the least attention to tortillard's supplication and putting her shoes off hastily i have taken off my shoes she added that i may steal on them quietly from behind it is almost dark but i can easily make out the little one by her cloak and i will do for the other no said the felon to-day it is useless there will be plenty of time to-morrow what you're afraid old patterer are you said the chouette with fierce contempt not at all replied the schoolmaster but you may fail in your blow and spoil all the dog which accompanied the country woman scenting the persons hidden in the hollow road stopped short and barked furiously refusing to come to fleur de marie who called him frequently do you hear their dog here they are your knife or if not cried the chouette with a threatening air come and take it from me then by force said the schoolmaster it's all over it's too late added the chouette after listening for a moment attentively they have gone by you shall pay for that gallows bird added she furiously shaking her fist at her accomplice a thousand francs lost by your stupidity a thousand two thousand perhaps three thousand gained replied the schoolmaster in a tone of authority listen chouette do you go back to barbillon and let him drive you to the place where you were to meet the man in mourning tell him that it was impossible to do anything to-day but that to-morrow she shall be carried off the young girl goes every evening to walk home with the priest and it was only a chance which to-day led her to meet with any one to-morrow we shall have a more secure opportunity so to-morrow do you return and be with barbillon at the cross-road and his coach at the same hour but thou thou tortillard shall lead me to the farm where the young girl lives i will cook up some tale say we have lost our road and ask leave to pass the night at the farm in a corner of the stable no one could refuse us that tortillard will examine all the doors windows and ins and outs of the house there is always money to be looked for amongst these farming people you say the farm is situated in a lone spot and when once we know all the ways and outlets we need only return with some safe friends and the thing is done as easy always downy what a headpiece said the chouette softening go on fourline to-morrow morning instead of leaving the farm i will complain of a pain which prevents me from walking if they will not believe me i'll show them the wound which i have always had since i smashed the loop of my darbies and which is always painful to me i'll say it is a burn i had from a red-hot bar when i was a workman and they'll believe me i'll remain at the farm part of the day whilst tortillard looks about him when the evening comes on and the little wench goes out as usual with the priest i'll say i'm better and fit to go away tortillard and i will follow the young wench at a distance and await your coming to us here as she will know us already she will have no mistrust when she sees us we will speak to her tortillard and i and when once within reach of my arms i will answer for the rest she's caught safe enough and a thousand francs are ours that is not all in two or three days we can give the office of the farm to barbillon and some others and share with them if they get any swag 
as it will be me who put them on the lay well done no eyes no one can come up to you said the chouette embracing the schoolmaster your plan is capital tell you what fourline when you are done up and old you must turn consulting prig you will earn as much money as a big wig come kiss your old woman and be off as quick as you may for these joskins go to sleep with their poultry i shall go to barbillon and to-morrow at four o'clock we will be at the cross-road with the trap unless he is nabbed for having assisted gros boiteux and the skeleton to do for the milkwoman's husband in the rue de la vieille draperie but if he can't come another can for the pretended hackney coach belongs to the man in mourning who has used it before a quarter of an hour after we get to the cross-road i will be here and wait for you all right good-bye till to-morrow chouette i had nearly forgot to give the wax to tortillard if there is any lock to get the print of at the farm here chickabiddy do you know how to use it said the one-eyed wretch to tortillard as she gave him a piece of wax yes yes my father showed me how to use it i took for him the print of the lock of the little iron chest which my master the quack doctor keeps in his small closet ah that's all right and that the wax may not stick do not forget to moisten the wax after you have warmed it well in your hand i know all about it replied tortillard to-morrow then fourline said the chouette to-morrow replied the schoolmaster the chouette went towards the coach the schoolmaster and tortillard quitted the hall away and bent their steps towards the farm the lights which shone from the windows serving to guide them on their way strange fatality which again brought Anselme durenel under the same roof with his wife who had not seen him since his condemnation to hard labour for life End of chapter six read by celine major chapter seven part one of the mysteries of paris volume two this librivox recording is in the public domain the mysteries of paris by eugene sue chapter seven part one an evening at the farm perhaps a more gratifying sight does not exist than the interior of a large farm kitchen prepared for the evening meal especially during the winter season its bright wood fire the long table covered with the savoury smoking dishes the huge tankards of foaming beer or cider with the happy countenances scattered around speak of peaceful labour and healthful industry the farm kitchen of bouqueval was a fine exemplification of this remark its immense open chimney about six feet high and eight feet wide resembled the yawning mouth of some huge oven on the hearth blazed and sparkled enormous logs of beech or oak and from this prodigious brazier there issued forth such a body of light as well as heat that the large lamp suspended from the centre beam sunk into insignificance and was rendered nearly useless every variety of culinary utensils sparkling in all the brightness of the most elaborate cleanliness and composed invariably of copper brass and tin glowed in the bright radiance of the winter fire as they stood ranged with the utmost nicety and effect on their appropriate shelves an old-fashioned cistern of elaborately polished copper showed its bright face polished as a mirror and close beside stood a highly polished bread trough and cover composed of walnut tree wood rubbed by the hand of housewifery till you could see your face in it and from which issued a most tempting smell of hot bread a long and substantial table occupied the centre of the kitchen a tablecloth which though coarse in texture vied with the falling snow for whiteness covered its entire length while for each expected guest was placed an earthenware plate brown without but white within and by its side a knife fork and spoon lustrous as silver itself in the midst of the table an immense tureen of vegetable soup smoked like the crater of a volcano and diffused its savoury vapours over a dish of ham and greens flanked by a most formidable array of mutton most relishly stewed with onions and potatoes below was placed a large joint of roast veal followed by two great plates of winter salad supported by a couple of baskets of apples and a similar number of cheeses completed the arrangements of the table three or four stone pitchers filled with sparkling cider 
and a like quantity of loaves of brown bread equal in size to the stones of a windmill were placed at the discretionary use of the supping party an old shaggy black shepherd dog almost toothless the superannuated patriarch of all the canine tribe employed on the farm was by reason of his great age and long services indulged with permission to enjoy the cheering warmth of the chimney corner but using his privilege with the utmost modesty and discretion this venerable servitor who answered to the pastoral name of lysander lay quietly stretched out in a secure side nook his nose resting on his paws watching with the deepest attention the various culinary preparations which preceded the supper the bill of fare thus presented to the reader as the ordinary mode of living at the farm of bouqueval may strike some of our readers as unnecessarily sumptuous but madame georges faithfully following out the wishes of rodolphe endeavoured by all possible means to improve the comforts of the labourers on the farm who were always selected as being the most worthy and industrious individuals of their district they were well paid liberally treated and so kindly used that to be engaged on the bouqueval farm was the highest ambition of all the best labourers in that part of the country an ambition which most essentially promoted the welfare and advantage of the masters they then served for no applicant for employment at bouqueval could obtain a favourable hearing unless he came provided with most satisfactory testimonials from his last employer thus though on a very small scale had rodolph created a species of model farm which had for its aim not only the improvement of animals in agricultural operations but above all improving the nature of man himself and this he effected by making it worth their while to be active honest and intelligent after having completed all the preparations for supper and placed on the table a jug of wine to accompany the dessert the farm cook sounded the welcome tocsin which told all that the cheering meal was prepared and their evening toil concluded they might freely enjoy the delights of wholesome and temperate refreshment ere the sound had ceased to vibrate on the ear a merry joyous throng composed of men and maidens to the number of twelve or fifteen crowded around the table the men had open manly countenances the women looked healthy and good-humoured while the young girls belonging to the party wore the brightest glow of youth and innocence every face was lighted up with frank gaiety content and the satisfaction arising from the consciousness of having well fulfilled one's duty thus happily prepared in mind and body to do justice to the excellent fare set before them the happy party took their appointed places at table the upper end was occupied by an old white-haired labourer whose fine bold yet sensible expression of face bespoke him a descendant of the ancient gaulish mothers of the soil father chatelain for so was this nestor called had worked on the farm from his early childhood when rodolph purchased the farm the old servant had been strongly recommended to him and he was forthwith raised to the rank of overlooker and under the orders of madame georges general superintendent of all outdoor work and unbounded indeed was the influence possessed by father chatelet by virtue of his age his knowledge and experience every one having taken their seat father chatelet having fervently invoked a blessing then in pursuance of an ancient and pious custom marked one of the loaves with the figure of a cross and cut off a large slice as the share of the virgin or the poor then pouring out a glass of wine with a similar consecration to charitable purposes he reverently placed both bread and wine on a plate placed in the centre of the table purposely to receive them at this moment the yard dogs barked furiously old lysander replied by a low growl and curling back his upper lip displayed two or three still formidable fangs some person is passing near the wall of the courtyard observed father chatelet scarcely had the words been uttered than the bell of the great gate sounded who can this possibly be at so late an hour said the old labourer every one belonging to the place is in go and see who it is jean René. the individual thus addressed was a stout able-bodied young labourer on the farm who was then busily employed blowing his scalding hot soup with a force of lungs that aeolus himself might have envied but used to prompt obedience in a moment the half-raised spoon was deposited in its place and half stifling a sigh of regret he departed on his errand this is the first time our good madame georges and mademoiselle marie have failed paying a visit to the warm chimney-corner and looking on whilst we took our supper for this long time said father chatelain 
i am hungry as a hunter but i shall not relish my supper half so well madame georges is in the chamber of mademoiselle marie who found herself somewhat indisposed on her return from escorting monsieur le cure to the rectory replied claudine the girl who had conducted la goualeuse back from the rectory and thus unconsciously frustrated the evil designs of the chouette i trust mademoiselle marie is only indisposed not seriously ill is she claudine inquired the old man with almost paternal anxiety oh dear no father chatelain god forbid i hope and believe our dear mademoiselle is only just a little struck with the cold of the night and her walk perhaps fatigued her i trust she will be quite well by to-morrow indeed madame georges told me as much and said that if she had had any fears she should have sent to paris for m david the negro doctor who took such care of mademoiselle when she was so ill well i cannot make out how any one can endure a black doctor for my part i should not have the slightest confidence in anything he said or did no no if one must have a doctor let it be a christian man with a white skin but a downright blackamoor oh saints above why the very sight of him by my bedside would kill me but did not this m david cure mademoiselle marie from the long illness with which she suffered when she first came here inquired the old man yes father chatelain he certainly did well ah but for all that father chatelain a doctor with a black face is enough to terrify any one i should scream myself into fits if he were to come rolling up the great whites of his eyes at me but is it not this m david the same person who cured dame anica of that dreadful wound in her leg which had confined her to her bed for upward of three years yes exactly so father chatelain he certainly did set old dame anica up again well then my child nay but only think a black man and when one is ill too when one can so ill bear up against such horrid things if he were only a little dark or even deep brown but quite quite a black all black oh father chatelain i really cannot bring myself to think of it tell me my child what colour is your favourite heifer musette oh white white as a swan father chatelain and such a milcher i can say that for the poor thing without the least falsehood a better cow we have not got on the farm and your other favourite rosette rosette oh she is as black as a raven not one white hair about her i should say and indeed to do her justice she is a first-rate milcher also i hardly know which is the best she or my pretty musette and what coloured milk does she give why white of course father chatelain i really thought you knew that is her milk as white and as good as the milk of your snowy pet musette every bit as good in colour and quality although rosette is a black cow to be sure why father chatelain what difference can it possibly make to the milk whether the cow that gives it is black white red or brown how then my good girl can it in any way signify whether a doctor has a black or white skin or what his complexion may be well answered claudine fairly hunted into a corner from which no argument could rescue her well as regards what makes a black doctor not so good as a white one it is it is because a black skin is so very ugly to look at and a white one is so much more agreeable to one's eyes i'm sure i can't think of any other reason father chatelain if i try for ever but with cows the colour of the skin makes not the very least difference of that you may be assured but then you know there's a deal of difference between a cow and a man these not very clear physiognomical reflections of claudine touching the effect of light or dark skins in the human and animal race were interrupted by the return of jean rené blowing his fingers with animation as he had before blown his soup oh how cold how cold it is this night he exclaimed on entering it is enough to freeze one to death it is a pretty deal more snug and comfortable indoors than out this bitter night oh how cold it is why the frost that cometh from north and east biteth the most and ceaseth the least don't you know that my lad said the old superintendent chatelain but who was it that rang so late a poor blind man and a boy who leads him about father chatelain 
and what does this poor blind man want inquired chatelain the poor man and his son were going by the cross-road to louvre and have lost themselves in the snow and as the cold is enough to turn a man into an icicle and the night is pitch dark the poor blind father has come to entreat permission for himself and lad to pass the night on the farm he says he shall be for ever thankful for leave to lie on a little straw under a hovel or in any outbuilding oh as for that i am quite sure that madame georges who never refuses charity to any unfortunate being will willingly permit them to do so but we must first acquaint her with it go claudine and tell her the whole story claudine disappeared and where is this poor man waiting asked father chatelain in the little barn just by but why in the barn why put him there bless you if i had left him in the yard the dogs would have eaten him up alive why father chatelain it was no use for me to call out quiet medor come here turk down sultan i never saw dogs in such a fury and besides we don't use our dogs on the farm to fly at poor folks as they are trained to do at other places well my lads it seems that the share for the poor has not been laid aside in vain to-night but try and sit a little closer there that'll do now put two more plates and knives and forks for this blind traveller and his boy for i feel quite certain what madame georges's answer will be and that she will desire them to be housed here for the night it is really a thing i can't make out said jean rené about the dogs being so very violent especially turk who went with claudine this evening to the rectory why when i stroked him to try and pacify him i felt his coat standing up on end like so many bristles of a porcupine now what do you say to that eh father chatelain you know almost everything why my lad i who know everything say just this that the beasts know far more than i do and can see farther i remember in the autumn when the heavy rains had so swollen the little river i was returning with my team horses one dark night i was riding upon cuckoo the old roan horse and deuce take me if i could make out any spot it would be safe to wade through for the night was as dark as the mouth of a pit well i threw the bridle on old cuckoo's back and he soon found what i'll answer for it none of us could have discovered now who taught the dumb brute to know the safe from the unsafe parts of the stream let me ask you ay father chatelain that's what i was waiting to ask you who taught the old roan to discover danger and escape from it so cleverly the same almighty wisdom which instructs the swallow to build in our chimneys and guides the marten to make his nest among the reeds of our banks my lad well claudine said the ancient oracle of the kitchen to the blooming dairymaid who just then entered bearing on her arms two pairs of snowy white sheets from which an odoriferous smell of sage and thyme was wafted along well i make no doubt but madame georges has sent permission for these poor creatures the blind man and his child to sleep here has she not these sheets are to prepare beds for them in the little room at the end of the passage said claudine go and bid them come in then jean rené and you claudine my good girl put a couple of chairs near the fire they will be glad of a good warm before sitting down to table the furious barking of the dogs was now renewed mingled with the voice of jean rené who was endeavouring to pacify them the door of the kitchen was abruptly opened and the schoolmaster and tortillard entered with as much precipitation as though they feared a pursuit from some dangerous foe for the love of heaven keep off your dogs cried the schoolmaster in the utmost terror they have been trying to bite us they have torn a great bit out of my blouse whined tortillard shivering with cold and pale with fear don't be frightened good man said jean rené shutting the door securely but i never before saw our dogs in such a perfect fury it must be the cold makes them so spiteful perhaps being half frozen they fancied biting you would serve to warm them there is no knowing what mere animals may mean by what they do why are you going to begin too exclaimed the old farmer as lysander who had hitherto lain perfectly happy in the radiance of the glowing fire started up and growling fiercely 
was about to fly at the strangers this old dog is quiet enough but having heard the other dogs make such a furious noise he thinks he must do the same will you lie down and be quiet you old brute do you hear sir lie down End of chapter seven part one read by celine major chapter seven part two of the mysteries of paris volume two this librivox recording is in the public domain the mysteries of paris by eugene sue chapter seven part two at these words from father chatelet accompanied by a significant motion of the foot lysander with a low deep growl of dissatisfaction slowly returned to his favourite corner by the hearth while the schoolmaster and tortillard remained trembling by the kitchen door as though fearful of approaching farther the features of the ruffian were so hideous from the frightful effects produced by the cold that some of the servants in the kitchen shuddered with alarm while others recoiled in disgust this impression was not lost on tortillard who felt reassured by the terrors of the villagers and even felt proud of the repulsiveness of his companion this first confusion over father chatelain thinking only of worthily discharging the duties of hospitality said to the schoolmaster come my good friend come near the fire and warm yourself thoroughly and then you shall have some supper with us for you happen to come very fortunately just as we were sitting down to table here sit down just where i have placed your chair but what am i thinking about added the worthy old labourer i ought to have spoken to your son not you seeing that it has pleased god to take away your eyesight a heavy loss a heavy loss but let us hope all for your good my friend though you may not think so here my boy lead your father to that snug place in the chimney corner yes kind sir drawled out tortillard with a nasal twang and canting hypocritical tone may god bless you for your charity to the poor blind here father take my arm lean on my shoulder father take care take care gently and with affected zeal and tenderness the urchin guided the steps of the brigand till they reached the indicated spot as the pair approached lysander he uttered a low growling noise but as the schoolmaster brushed past him and the sagacious animal had full scent of his garments he broke out into one of those deep howls with which it is asserted by the superstitious dogs frequently announce an approaching death what in the devil's name do all these cursed animals mean by their confounded noise said the schoolmaster to himself can they smell the blood on my clothes i wonder for i now recollect i wore the trousers i have on at present the night the cattle dealer was murdered did you notice that inquired jean rené of father chatelet why i vow that as often as old lysander had caught scent of the wandering stranger he actually set up a regular death howl and this remark was followed up by a most singular confirmation of the fact the cries of lysander were so loud and mournful that the other dogs caught the sound for the farmyard was only separated from the kitchen by a glazed window in the latter and according to the custom of the canine race they each strove who should outdo the other in repeating and prolonging the funeral wail which according to vulgar belief always foretells death though but little given to superstitious dread the farm people looked from one to another with a feeling of wonder not unmixed with awe even the schoolmaster himself diabolically hardened as he was felt a cold shudder steal over him at the thought that all these fatal sounds burst forth upon the approach of him the self-convicted murderer while tortillard too audacious and hardened to enter into such alarms with all the infidelity in which he had been trained even from his mother's arms looked on with delighted mockery at the universal panic and was perhaps the only person present devoid of an uneasy feeling but once freed from his apprehensions of suffering from the violence of the animals he listened even with pleasure to the horrible discord of their long drown-out wailings and felt almost tempted to pardon them the fright they had originally occasioned him in consideration of the perfect terror they had struck into the inhabitants of the farm and for the gratification he derived from the convulsive horror of the schoolmaster but after the momentary stupor had passed away 
Jean-René again quitted the kitchen, and the loud cracking of his whip soon put an end to the prophetic howlings of Medal, Turk, and Sultan, and quickly dispersed them to their separate kennels. And as the noise ceased, the gloomy cloud passed away from the kitchen, and the peasants looked up with the same honest cheerfulness they had worn upon the entrance of the two travellers. Ere long they had left off wondering at the repulsive ugliness of the schoolmaster, and only thought with pity of his great affliction in being blind. They commiserated the lameness of the poor boy, admired the interesting sharpness of his countenance, the deep, cute glance of his ever-moving eye, and, above all, loaded him with praises for the extreme care and watchfulness with which he attended to his afflicted parent. The appetite of the labourers, which had been momentarily forgotten, now returned with redoubled violence, and for a time nothing could be heard but the clattering of plates and rattling of knives and forks. Still, however busily employed with their suppers, the servants assembled round the table, both male and female, could not but remark, with infinite pleasure, the tender assiduity of the lad towards the blind creature who sat beside him. Nothing could exceed the devoted affection and filial care with which Tortillard prepared his meat for him, cutting both that and his bread with most accurate nicety, pouring out his drink, and never attempting even to taste a morsel himself till his father expressed himself as having completed his supper but for all this dutiful attention the young ruffian took ample and bitter revenge instigated as much by an innate spirit of cruelty as the desire of imitation natural to his age tortillard found an equal enjoyment with the chouette in having something to torment a bête de souffrance and it was a matter of inexpressible exultation to his wretched mind that he a poor distorted crippled abject creature should have it in his power to tyrannize over so powerful and ferocious a creature as the schoolmaster it was like torturing a muzzled tiger he even refined his gratification by compelling his victim to endure all the agonies he inflicted without wincing or exhibiting the slightest external sign of his suffering thus he accompanied each outward mark of devoted tenderness towards his supposed parent by aiming a severe kick against the schoolmaster's legs on one of which there was in common with many who had long worked in the galleys a deep and severe wound the effect of the heavy iron chain worn during the term of punishment around the right leg and by way of compelling the miserable sufferer to exercise a greater degree of stoical courage the urchin always seized the moment when the object of his malice was either drinking or speaking here dear father here is a nice peeled nut said tortillard placing on the plate of his supposed parent a nut carefully prepared good boy said old chatelet smiling kindly at him then addressing the bandit he added however great may be your affliction my friend so good a son is almost sufficient to make up even for the loss of sight but providence is so gracious he never takes away one blessing without sending another you are quite right kind sir my lot is a very hard one and but for the noble conduct of my excellent child i a sharp cry of irrepressible anguish here broke from the quivering lips of the tortured man the son of bras rouge had this time aimed his blow so effectually that the point of his heavy nailed shoe had reached the very centre of the wound and produced an endurable agony father dear father what is the matter exclaimed tortillard in a whimpering voice then suddenly rising he threw both his arms round the schoolmaster's neck whose first impulse of rage and pain was to stifle the limping varlet in his herculean grasp and so powerfully did he compress the boy's chest against his own that his impeded respiration vented itself in a low moaning sound a few minutes and tortillard's last prank would have been played but reflecting that the lad was for the present indispensable to the furtherance of the schemes he had on hand the schoolmaster by a violent effort controlled his desire to annihilate his tormentor and contented himself with pushing him off his shoulders back into his own chair the sympathizing group around the table were far from seeing through all this and merely considered these close embraces as an interchange of paternal and filial tenderness while the half-suffocation and deadly pallor of tortillard they attributed to emotion caused by the sudden illness of his beloved father what ailed you just now my good man inquired father chatelain only see you have quite frightened your poor boy why he looks pale as death 
and can scarcely breathe come my little man you must not take on so your father is all right again i beg your pardon gentlemen all replied the schoolmaster controlling himself with much difficulty for the pain he was still enduring was most excruciating i am better now i'll tell you with your kind leaves all about it you see i am by trade a working locksmith and one day that i was employed in beating out a huge bar of red-hot iron it fell over on my two legs and burnt them so dreadfully that it never healed unfortunately just now i happened to strike the leg that is worst against the table and the sudden agony it occasioned me drew forth the sudden cry which so much disturbed all this good company and for which i humbly beg your pardon poor dear father whined out tortillard casting a look of fiendish malice at the shivering schoolmaster and wholly recovered from his late attack of excessive emotion poor father you have indeed got a bad leg nobody can cure ah kind gentleman i hope you will never have such a shocking wound and be obliged to hear all the doctors say it will never get well no never never oh my dear dear father how i wish i could but suffer the pain instead of you at this tender moving speech the females present expressed the utmost admiration for the dutiful speaker and began feeling in their vast pockets for some more substantial mark of their regard it is unlucky my honest friend said old chatelain addressing the schoolmaster you had not happened to come to this farm about three weeks ago instead of to-night and why so if you please because we had staying for a few days in the house a celebrated paris doctor who has an infallible remedy for all diseases of the legs a worthy old woman belonging to our village had been confined to her bed upwards of three years with some affection of the legs well this doctor being here as i said heard of the case applied an unguent to the wounds and now bless you she is as sure-footed ay and as swift too as any of our young girls and the first holiday she makes she intends walking to the house of her benefactor in the allée des veuves at paris to return her grateful thanks to be sure it is a good step from hence but then as mother annika says why what has come over you again my friend is your leg still so painful the mention of the allée des veuves had recalled such frightful recollections to the schoolmaster that involuntarily a cold shudder shook his frame while a fearful spasm by contracting his ghastly countenance made it appear still more hideous yes replied he trying to conceal his emotion a sudden darting pain seized me and pray excuse my interrupting your kind and sensible discourse and be pleased to proceed it really is a great pity resumed the old labourer that this excellent doctor should not be with us at present but i tell you what he is as good as he is skilful and i am quite sure if you let your little lad conduct you to his house when you return to paris that he will cure you his address is not difficult to recollect it is seventeen allée des veuves even should you forget the number it will not matter for there are but very few doctors in the neighbourhood and no other negro surgeon for only imagine this clever kind and charitable man is a black but his heart is white and good his name is david dr david you will be able to remember that name i dare say the features of the schoolmaster were so seamed and scarred that it was difficult to perceive when his colour varied he did however on the present occasion turn ghastly pale as he first heard the exact number mentioned of rodolph's house and afterwards the description of the black doctor of david the negro surgeon who by rodolph's orders had inflicted on him the fearful punishment the terrible results of which were each hour more painfully developed father chatelet however was too much interested in his subject to notice the deadly paleness of the schoolmaster and proceeded with his discourse when you leave us my poor fellow we will be sure to write his address on a slip of paper and give it to your son for i know that besides putting you in a certain way to be cured of your painful wound it would be gratifying to monsieur david to be able to relieve your sufferings oh he is so good never so happy as when he has rendered any person a service 
i wish he had not always that mournful and dejected look i fear he has some heavy care near his heart and he is so good so full of pity for all who suffer well well providence will bless him in another world but come friend let us drink to the health and happiness of your future benefactor here take this mug no thank you returned the schoolmaster with a gloomy air none for me i-i am not thirsty and i never drink unless i am nay friend but this is good old wine i have poured out for you not cider said the labourer many tradespeople do not drink as good bless your heart this farm is not conducted as other farms are what do you think of our style of living by the by have you relished your supper all very good responded the schoolmaster mechanically more and more absorbed in the painfulness of his ideas well then as we live one day so we do another we work well we live well we have a good conscience and an equally good bed to rest upon after the labours of the day our lives roll on in peace and contentment there are seven labourers constantly employed on the farm who are paid almost double wages to what others get but then i can venture to assert that if we are paid double we do as much work among us as fourteen ordinary labourers would do the mere husbandry servants have one hundred and fifty crowns a year the dairy women and other females engaged about the place sixty crowns and a tenth share of the produce of the farm is divided among us all you may suppose we do not idle away much time or fail to make hay while the sun shines for nature is a bountiful mother and ever returns a hundredfold to those who assiduously seek her favour the more we give her the more she returns your master cannot get very rich if he treats you and pays you thus liberally said the schoolmaster oh our master is different to all others and has a mode of repaying himself peculiarly his own from what you say answered the blind man hoping by engaging in conversation to escape from the gloominess of his own thoughts your master must be a very extraordinary person indeed he is my good man a most uncommon master to meet with now as chance has brought you among us and a strange though a lucky chance for you it has proved lying out of the high road as this village does it is so very seldom any stranger ever finds it out well i was going to say here you are and no fault to find with your quarters is there now in all human probability when you turn your back upon the place you will never return to it but you shall not depart without hearing from me a description of our master and all he has done for the farm upon condition that you promise to repeat it again wherever you go and to whomsoever you may meet with you will see i mean i beg your pardon you will then be able to understand i listen to you answered the schoolmaster proceed and i can promise you you will not be throwing away your time by listening replied the venerable chatelain now one day our master thought all at once here i am rich enough to eat two dinners a day if i liked but i don't now suppose i were to provide a meal for those who have none at all and enable such as can hardly procure half a dinner to enjoy as much good food as they desired would not that be better than overindulging myself so it shall be says he and away he goes to work and first thing he buys this farm which was not much of a concern then and scarcely kept a couple of ploughs at work and being born and bred on the place i ought to know something about it next master made considerable additions to the farm i'll tell you all about that by and by at the head of the farm he placed a most worthy and respectable female who had known a great deal of trouble in her past life master always chose out people for their goodness and their misfortunes and when he brought the person i am telling you of here he said to her in my hearing i wish this place to be like the temple of our great maker open to the deserving and the afflicted but closed against the wicked and hardened reprobate 
so idle beggars are always turned from the gate but those who are able and willing to work have always the opportunity set before them the charity of labour our master says is no humiliation to him who receives it but a favour and service conferred on the person whose labour is thus done and the rich man who does not act upon this principle but ill employs his wealth so said our master but he did more than talk he acted there was formerly a road from here to ecouen which cut off a good mile of distance but lord love you it was one great ruddy bog impossible to get up or down it it was the death of every horse and certain destruction to every vehicle that attempted to pass through it a little labour and a trifling amount of money from each farmer in the adjoining country would soon have repaired the road but they never could be brought to any unanimity on the subject and in proportion as one farmer would be anxious to contribute towards putting the road in order the others would invariably decline sending either men or money to assist so our master perceiving all this said the road shall be repaired but as those who can afford to contribute will not and as it is more for convenience and accommodation to the rich than necessity for the poor it shall first become useful to those who would work if they could get it to do who have heart and hands and courage but no employ well this road shall be reserved as a constant occupation for persons of this description horsemen and carriages belonging to the rich and affluent who care not how roads are repaired so that they can travel at their ease may go round by the farther side so for example whenever a strong sturdy fellow presented himself at the farm pleading hunger and want of work i'd say to him here my lad here is a basin of warm nourishing soup take it and welcome then if you wish to work here is a pickaxe and spade one of our people will show you the equa road make every day twelve feet of it good by spreading and breaking the flints and every evening after your work is examined you shall receive at the rate of forty sous for the quantity named twenty sous for half as much ten sous for a quarter for less than that nothing at all then towards evening upon my return from labour i used to go on the road measure their work and examine whether it was well done and only to think interposed jean rené in a fit of virtuous indignation only think now of their coming two heartless vagabonds who drank their soup and walked off with the pickaxe and shovel it is enough to sicken one of doing good or trying to benefit one's fellow-creatures quite right master rené exclaimed the other labourers so it is come come lads resumed father chatelet don't be too warm just see here we might as well say it is useless to plant trees or sow grain because there are caterpillars weevils and other injurious insects that gnaw the leaves or devour the seeds put in the ground no no we destroy the vermin but god almighty who is no niggard causes fresh buds to birth forth and new ears of corn to sprout the damage is abundantly repaired and no trace remains of the mischievous insects which have passed over our work am i not right my friend said the old labourer addressing the schoolmaster no doubt no doubt replied the latter who had appeared for some time past lost in a train of serious meditation then as for women and children there is plenty of occupation for them also according to their age and strength added father chatelain yet spite of all this observed claudine joining in the conversation the road gets on but very slowly which only goes to prove my good girl that in this part of the country there is happily no scarcity of employment for the honest and industrious labourer but now as in the case of a poor helpless afflicted creature such as i am said the schoolmaster hastily would not the worthy owner of the farm grant me a humble corner in it for charity's sake a shelter and a morsel of bread for the little while i have to remain a burden to any one in this troublesome world oh my worthy sir could i but obtain such a boon i would pass the remainder of my days in praying for a blessing on my benefactor End of chapter seven
part two read by celine major